Hi, this is Charlie Montatuyello with another video on Native American flute making. And what we're going to be doing this time is focusing on the drone flute. I know I've made other videos showing you how to make drone flutes, um, but this time we're going to use some river cane, which a lot of you have bamboo and, and stuff like that on hand. I want to show you how to do every little step of it along the way. Of course, we're not going to take all day doing it either, wink wink. But, uh, but anyway, I wanted to show you all the steps that I take so that you can do this yourself. And it's really not that hard. Um, so we're going to make one out of ban or out of river cane here, which is like bamboo, uh, our sawgrass that we have, any of the uh, other materials like we talked in one of our last videos about alternate flute materials. You can use any of that kind of stuff. Um, this is a western cedar flute that we've made, a uh, drone. You can see it's a double chamber in there. This one I'm going to go ahead and finish for myself because tomorrow we're planning on starting to make some more drone flute playing videos. So tongue twister. Anyway, so I'm going to finish this one for myself because I personally don't own a drone flute of any kind. Um, well, I've got one from Greece that a friend gave to me, but, but beyond that, thanks Bob, but uh, beyond that, we uh, are going to finish this guy up here tonight, so we'll have that one to play on some videos tomorrow, so definitely look for those videos. But uh, this guy is going to be a drone out of river cane, and it'll be an A-frame, as people call them, about something like that. And so the first thing I've got to do is get the drone chamber, which is just a piece of river cane. It took me a little while after I've got the flute that I wanted um, and the shape and size and pretty close to the key that I'm looking for. After I got it the way I wanted it, then I had to go hunt for a piece of, uh, of drone making material, the drone chamber, that is similar in diameter and size and all that kind of mess. Uh, and look because when you make this, you know, if you make them professionally, they've got to look really, you know, close to the same too. If you're making them for yourself, you can have a drone over here about this long and have this guy over here whatever size you want and it'll be just fine. So, we're going to go ahead and finish this piece up. We do have a lot of other videos on uh, making flutes, so if you need to refer back to any of those, that's fine. I'm going to go ahead and, and grind this guy down. And we'll go. Okay, so now I have the flute that plays, it's close to the key that I want it, not exactly in the key, so I'm going to be doing a little trimming here, which I wanted you to see. And then I've got my drone chamber. They look very similar. They play... And that's the bottom note, of course. Which is fine, because we need the drone chamber to be trimmed up anyway. So he's good. And if you need uh, uh, to learn more about how to make the flute play, or to make the block area, the track, or any of this kind of stuff, we of course have videos specifically on all of that. Um, we're uh, working on organizing them right now so that they, you know, you can say, well, I want to learn how to do this. And, you know, anyway, so uh, what we're going to do right now is we're going to tune this flute. And for those of you that's been following me for a while, you know, I've always used my cell phone. I recommend if you guys have an Android uh, smartphone, you can download an app, the one that I used for the longest time and still use on my tablets is called G-String. I'm not an advocate of the company. I don't know anything about them other than I use their software. So. Uh, you guys can check them out. This is an inexpensive little tuner, a really nice one, but still an inexpensive one I bought. It's a Korg brand, which I've always been fond of Sony and Korg. Um, got a lot of other music equipment, of course, but uh, but this guy here, it shows you uh, you know what what tone you're in, <laughs> and you can of course calibrate it from like 420 to 460, I think. So it's no, I think it goes up to 560. So I can get those 528 customers taken care of. But anyways, so uh, neat little tuner, does its job, and I'm going to show you how that works in just a second. Let's see what key this flute's in. I don't know if you can see it too well from there. I'm going to have to zoom in. And the bottom note being a B flat, it's out of tune anyway, so it's one that was just laying in a pile of flutes that I needed to finish. And this guy here is one that will be tuned to a key of C. You see the top note's almost a perfect B, but I have a little bit of room, I believe, to change that. And after I trim about an inch off the bottom here, the bottom note should be a C. So you guys stir at that tuner while I uh, cut this off. Of course, you hear my little saw there. I'm really fond of using a scroll saw for cutting river cane and bamboo with. Uh, and even flutes, anything that's round for that matter. I like uh, the scroll saw better than I do a band saw or any other, like a chop saw or any of that mess because the scroll saw uh, is very smooth, has a very thin blade, and it has a lot of good, good benefit of using it. 
still showing a B flat. I'm just double checking to make sure I'm going to be able to cut this guy enough. Okay, so let's hear that bottom note. Pretty close to a B there. I like to leave it like that and not mess with it any further until I get the other uh, flute attached to it. And I'll show you how we're going to do that. So I'm going to turn the tuner off. We're probably going to zoom back out. Now we've got these two pieces. If you notice, the drone chamber flute is a lot longer. And I'm probably going to wind up cutting it off there. But we're going to do it incrementally, just like we did with the main flute chamber because even though you think that these flutes are about the same size and diameter and about the same length if we cut this flute off here it could be as much as a whole step more sharp or a whole step more flat than the other chamber so the first thing we're going to do now that we've got our main flute playing close to the way we want it not all exactly in tune which we'll discuss and get to that in just a moment but I want to show you how we're going to fix them together which is the, probably the most important part of using the two separate chambers so I've got my belt sander here. You could easily do this with a piece of sandpaper, sanding around in circles. Believe me, it, it's possible. We just want to make a nice little angle there. Really kind of guessing, but uh, you know the angle is, is honest to God, it's maybe five degrees, but I wouldn't even bother. You know, we're just guessing at what that's going to be. And then remember where you're putting this too. I like to make my drone flute so that the playing chamber is on the right side. At least it's right when you're playing it. It's on your left side now, but on the right side. Um, and then the drone chamber is on the other side. Just be mindful and think about how you're doing this. If you want to do it the other way around, make sure you know where you're sanding. Anyway, so we have this piece sanded here. Now we need to sand on the inside of this piece, just the same. You want to make sure that you keep the uh, fingering as well as the mouthpiece, sound hole, all the stuff needs to be straight and in line. You want to make it this way because then two pieces will go and one will be splaying outward. So we're going to make them exactly, or as close to exactly, um, I guess square, perpendicular, parallel. What would you call it if it's a smaller angle? Acute? No, I don't think so. Anyway. See how that looks just for the sake of trying it. it doesn't look too shabby and I'm actually just holding them together with my hand there so that I think is how I'm going to leave it the next piece we're going to do is use my old trusty friend cyan acrylic glue otherwise known as super glue crazy glue named a lot of different things they sell it all over the world. Be mindful of the vapors. I'm using this outside, so the vapors aren't so bad. But I'm also, I've also uh, got a lot of breathing training, <laughs> so I know when to breathe and when not to breathe. This stuff really gives off a of vapor. So if you can kind of see what I did there, I just put them together. The good thing about this super glue is it takes hold really quick so you've got just really seconds before it's too late you're at the point of no return <laughs> um, sign acrylic glue is also a permanent fix to this kind of thing um, it is for all intents and purposes lots of acrylic inside of a, um, a mixture and it sets inside of the pores of the wood pores of the plastic glass, whatever the package says that it will glue together, it soaks into the pores of anything. And for it to find those pores in glass, that's, that's really saying something, right? So, let me see, that's pretty good there. I'm just going to set him down so I can put my lid on. don't like to waste this stuff. There's a lot of different brands. I found a uh, an inexpensive one that works best for me. There's some uh, expensive ones that are kind of hey, eh. and uh, then there's stuff like uh, Gorilla Super Glue, which is pretty good, but it's not really like the regular Gorilla Glue. Just like their wood glue isn't originally, you know, the same uh, uh, what do you call it polyurethane glue that you get in the spray can um, or in their other bottles. It expands. 
Um, Gorilla Glue comes in a lot of different flavors and basically, don't eat this stuff, but <laughs> it comes in a lot of different uh, types and, and uh, styles and everything and their super glue is nothing more than super glue and maybe a little bit of acrylic added to it, or uh, excuse me, polyurethane added to it. Their wood glue I don't believe has any polyurethane in it at all. I'm going to wipe this excess off so we can speed up the process just a little bit. We can come back and clean up any runoff that may have occurred. One thing I'm going to do is go ahead and shape the mouthpiece. A lot of you probably were wondering, well, how do you stick those things together? That's how you do it. I tried wood glue and some other glues, and they're just not quite the same as good old trusty cyanacrylic glue, otherwise known as super glue, crazy glue, and so many others. So we still have two independent chambers. There's a partition still in between the two of them. I'm sorry, so y'all can see it a little bit better. There's a partition between the two, so you can still blow just this one side and play one side of the flute, or you can play both at the same time. One thing to take into uh, consideration to keep in mind is that if you're making a large diameter flute, like you know, bamboo that's more than an inch in diameter, you're going to have to be able to spread your mouth across this entire area to blow through it if you leave it open. If you close it up with a piece of wood and then drill some holes, you know, it's a little bit more work, but you can achieve what you might be trying to, to achieve that way. I personally like higher tone flutes in general because they're the flutes that were originally made and also higher tone flutes uh, are easier to play, easier to hear. There's so much going on. But, and I'm going to put a partition in here, a partition, a uh, brace in here in just a moment, but we'll get to that momentarily. First, I just want to try playing it. So now we know that this guy here is way off. Let's go ahead and trim him up just a little bit. of you diehard flute fans out there saying, well, shouldn't you be looking at that on the tuner? We'll talk about that in just a minute. Let's see where we're at. That's wild, isn't it? What I'm doing is I'm restricting the flow of air in the bottom of the one that I think should be sharp, which makes it go flat. So restricting the flow of air, that's a tuning technique that's really going to help you tune this flute. So I'm going to go ahead and trim some more off. see. Now I'm going to grab my tuner. You don't have to watch this. What I'm doing is just checking to see how close we are to what I need to be in to have it sound close to this flute. So trim just a little bit more off. that little bit of warble in there, a uh, little bit of uh, disharmony, is because this chamber is a little flat, this chamber is just about on the money, and your ear may not even hear that difference until you start playing them together. You hear how it's going, whoa, 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 whoa. Well, it's doing that, like I say, this one's a little flatter than this one. I can see it on the tuner, you don't have to see that, just trust me, and uh, I'll show you how to check it. This is where uh, restricting the flow here really helps. So watch what I'm doing. I could do it on here. I could, if I could reach my finger down to it, I could do it. Just anything to restrict the airflow. So watch. You see how very little restriction I'm giving it. I'm giving it the, the uh, small amount of opening that's right here without really changing much of it, just basically giving it a sounding board. Um, that tiny bit of restriction, which is probably the equivalent of keeping my finger like that, is making it in tune. So let's go ahead and sand it. You 
and see where we're at. And to most everybody, they think, well, that sounds great. That was so easy. How is this video? I'm looking down at my timer on this thing, and the video is like another 10 or 15 minutes, right? Well, the point of the matter is that although they're in tune with each other, and most of the notes on the flute side are in, kind of close to being in tune where they need to be, um, all of the notes on this flute side are not in tune with this tone. And plus, I like to be able to play that top octave on it. And let's see what key the top octave is. Usually, it's going to be really close to what the bottom note is. And usually, it's going to be really close to the bottom note, but just about this much sharp. So, that means something, and that's very important. Uh, what we're going to do, I think, we can probably focus back over here on the tuner so I can show you where we're at. Okay, so now we're going to look at what key this guy's in. I like to say the bottom note is a B. And they're almost perfectly in tune there. Um, but then the next note, the D, if you can see that, is actually uh, about 10 cents on the flat side. So I'm going to make the hole slightly larger on this, uh, this fingering here, which is the D. And when I make the hole larger, it's going to make the D sharper. So just keep an eye on what's going on. Most of you know I use burning tools to do this. I'm just going to enlargeify this hole. And there's any doubt on what word to use, make your own up. That's actually how all that happened in the first place, by the way. Needs to go just a little bit more and burn it back here when my burning tool is hot anyway. Okay, let's see what this sounds like. How about that? Boy, that was perfect right here on the money. Let's see, the next one is, next one should be an E, but let's see what it sounds like. He's way flat. Burn the hole out. So, we uncovered the first note, which is a D. And this is a, a B minor pentatonic scale. So the first note we play is a B, then we uncover this first hole, it's a D. After the D, we go to E. So this hole right here is our E flute hole. It's like 15 cents flat, so I'm just going to burn the hole out just a tiny little bit larger. Not too much. Let's see what it sounds like. Looks good to me. And the next note actually should be an F sharp. 20 cents flat. Let's go ahead and burn him out. I will give you the schematics of this flute here in just a second. I know a lot of you are just saying to yourself, I wish you would just give me the distance of those holes and everything. And that looks pretty good to me. And then the next note is going to be an A. Boy, that one's really close, too, isn't it? Just five cents. And that B is a little sharp, which is actually not a bad thing. The B hole, which is the top fingering here, and of course this is the A that I just tuned, uh, which all of these are all perfect 440, and this guy here is a little bit on the sharp side by about 10 cents. Um, that's not a bad thing because this is a drone flute. Um, you can do this without a tuner, and the way that you do this without a tuner is just put it together, start playing them one at a time, and uh, walk up the scale, see what it sounds like. If it sounds right, and then try it with the drone chamber. If they sound right together, you're in good business. Which is pretty much what we're about to do right now, because even though the top note is 10 cents sharp, 
um, and the rest of the holes are perfectly in tune, I'm probably, from my own experience, probably going to be burning these guys out just a little bit more. But let's see what they sound like with the drone chamber, who is perfectly in 440, just like the bottom note on the other chamber. Actually, they all sound pretty good. Let's listen to this top one. I still hear a little bit of wobble, and I kind of gave myself away right there, uh, because when I jump octave on this chamber, and the way you jump off octave is just blow faster. When I jump octave on the drone chamber, you notice he's going about 15 cent sharp too. It's where that little arrow is, which is considered, I guess, in good tuning. If I blow too hard, it goes even more sharp. Let's see what I can do here. You can see the, the tuner and where it's at. How about that? I'm blowing and the bottom note's a little flat now. Blow a little harder, it's sharper. And if you blow soft enough on the jump octave, then it's in 440. But we still have some disharmony with the top note on this flute, which should be the same as overblowing on this flute. And you see me running my finger across it there to check it to see if this side needs to be more flat, which is not as easy to do as making it sharp, by the way. But it needs to be actually more sharp, which is a good thing. Now, to prove this to ourselves, not to you guys, but to prove this, um, that this side here needs to be more sharp, what we should do is check this chamber over here to see if we can make it more flat. Because we've now, we've kind of gotten the idea that making this one flat is a bad idea. You can hear the disharmony. But it sounds like it's getting closer when I take my finger off. What I'm going to do is blow this high note over here, and I'm going to slightly cover it up just a little bit and see if I can get them in tune. Now that's almost, I think you can probably see there, almost, uh, I guess a good fourth, almost a third of the flute is being covered up to do that. What I prefer to do, because that top note sounds flat to me, regardless of what the tuner says, the top note sounds flatter to the ear, um, and that's what really counts. You know, you can tune a flute to death until it's just completely, perfectly orchestrally in tune. If it doesn't sound right, what good is that? So, it is a good tuner though, by the way. I know for a fact. I checked it against everything when I first popped it out of the box. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make this hole just a little bit more sharp while this burning rod has been cooking back here. Not a whole lot, just a little bit. Let's see if that did it. It's still just a little bit on the flat side. Don't even need to check the chamber. I'm just gonna make the hole just a tiny bit. I think that might be it right there. Just a tiny bit larger. And if you're really a stickler for having this thing in tune on the tuner, you can try playing it. really soft and the note of course does come out perfectly in tune but when you blow hard it's way B sharp um, so let's see what they sound like together and if you hear it when I'm playing the the bottom note on the drone chamber um, it actually is perfectly in harmony and it is a harmony because it's two octaves you know two different octaves, but it's perfectly harmonious with the top note over here, which is actually a tad bit sharp. So, let's see what it sounds like with the jump octave.
I can do that with my mouth, by the way. One other thing you might want to note is that wherever you put your mouth on the drone, if you're supplying more air to this side, it may make this side play a little differently. If you're supplying more air to this side, it may make this side play a little more differently. So, I think that's great. So that's how I'm going to leave that guy. I'll show you tying the centerpiece on, and that'll be it on this particular drone flute lesson. Okay, so we've got our nice drone that plays really well. Like I say, you can make this out of just about anything that you've got material for. And, uh, let's see, this is going to be my little center brace, center support piece. Just basically took a piece of river cane that was about the same diameter as this, drilled some holes in it, and I'm going to tie it through in just a minute. But before I did, I'm going to make sure you guys knew that I didn't forget you on the measurements. So... The overall flute length doesn't really matter so much because you could have a mouthpiece that's only this long if you wanted, however it works out. What I'm going to measure is the distance from the partition up here, which is the important part. And we could make the distance from the center of the hole, but distance from the partition to the first fingering is going to be four and one quarter inches. The next hole is five and an eighth of an inch, that's this one. The next hole is going to be six and three quarters. This is going to be seven and seven eighths. And this one here is eight and seven eighths. And then the bottom of the flute is really about 12 inches long. So once again, we're looking at uh, this hole from here to the node or the block or the plug or whatever you want to call it inside of your flute is going to be four and a quarter, five and an eighth, six and three quarters, seven and seven eighths, eight and seven eighths, and then the bottom of the flute from here to this plug is going to be roughly 12 inches to make a B flute. The inside diameter of this said B flute is about, let me see, half, it's about I would say five-eighths of an inch in diameter. Let's check that with our handy-dandy dollar-something caliper. <laughs> okay, okay, so the inside of this guy is really, I'm going to call it, I'm going to call it five-eighths. Because uh, once I go around in circles here and check the diameter, it's going to shrink down a little bit. It's going to be five-eighths. So. So the inside diameter of this guy is about 5 eighths, probably close to the same over here, maybe a little bit smaller, but you know we worked through all that. So the next step, like I say, now that you know the measurements of a B flute, which of course all those measurements and how to make drones and make everything else is in our upcoming flute making book. Thank you guys for so patiently waiting. We are really almost about to go to press on it at this point on this particular video. And let's see where we're at here. So I've got a piece of leather lace. I'm going to poke it through the hole. Tying this thing on is really one of the trickiest parts. Okay, don't ever stick this stuff in your mouth, by the way. Don't ever do that. It's a bad idea. If you do it, it's okay with me if you do it. Just, you know, I told you not to. So we've got one side partially tied on. I'm going to go ahead and wrap this guy around. I like to make sure that it has a little bit more stability. And you don't want to tie your leather so tight that it's going to break. So let's go ahead and tie this side on just a little bit, not too much. We're going to push him up into place where he belongs. Be careful because you don't want to put too much stress on this piece up here. So we've got that piece tied for starters. And let's go on to the next one. I'll tell you too, when I'm making these things all day long, me and Jesse will uh, just trade off parts. Sometimes she'll make them and I'll tie the plug on. Sometimes I'll make them and she'll tie it on. But the real key here is to know what you're doing. <laughs> Take your time. 
have a mental image of what it is that you want to achieve. That's how this kind of stuff works. And see how I take the leather lace, it's got two different sides, a kind of a dull side and a shiny side. I lay the shiny side down. you got to think about all this stuff. It's really crazy, but you do. And same thing on this guy. It's what makes a really nice looking drone, or any kind of food, or anything that you do in life. Just put some consideration into it. Don't just slap it together. And when you're first doing something, you look at it later and think, well, I just slap that together, but you were concentrating so hard on it. I guess the more you do it, the more your concentration goes up. Uh, this is what one of my YouTubers calls prattle. <laughs> All of my good YouTubers out there, the ones I probably know by name, are just giggling in their, in their chairs right now watching this. Okay, so we've got those guys tied on. Makes kind of a nice little display. It's a lot tighter. My goodness, is that sucker on there. And doesn't affect the way it plays whatsoever. Boy, it sounds really good, too. If you notice, as with most of my flutes, this is a five-hole flute. Um, I do make six-hole flutes. The ones of you that know me or have asked this question and have gotten really lengthy answers. Um, six-hole flutes are very important. I have a philosophy about the reason that there are six holes in a flute. If I made this into a six-hole flute, the six-hole would be up here. We'd still have a nice place to tie our block at, which is really cool. Um, but most of you that have six-hole flutes that you don't play that hole anyway would be a good place to put it. But, uh, you know, and then just don't drop the hole out. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, so we have this guy tied on here. If you were making the modern style of six hole flute where you drill that hole and never play it, you could put this plug down here or up even closer, or you could spread it a little further apart and then do something similar with it. But, uh, needless to say, this is a River Cane drone flute, simple to make. You know, the technique of tuning it is not something you have to have a tuner for. Something that you can uh, you can really do a uh, uh, hobbyist. What's that word I used earlier? Noviest? Yeah, I think uh, the home noviest could probably do this. Chances are you could probably create it out of PVC. I'm not going to rush into the idea of doing that. Um, but something simple to do, man. I mean, this is way easy to go uh, together. And uh, there it is. So... If you guys have any further questions about making flutes or playing flutes, uh, please don't forget to watch for our new videos, and you'll get to see one of our next videos will be me playing this one and showing you how to play some different songs, which we've started making more how to play this song and that song video, which we like. Um, but uh, if you have any other questions, shoot us an email, send us a message, ask us a question on our Facebook page, which is Blue Bear Arts. Um, our website, of course, is bluebearflutes.com. And uh, I hope you've enjoyed and found some use in this video. So once again, this is Charlie Montatoyella signing out for Blue Bear Flutes. You guys take care and happy flute making.